1.12 is a rehash of 1.11 where we're basically doing the exact same calculations here with the only exception being that we're sort of switching out the position space for momentum space. So uh, we have the exact same scenario as in 1.11 where we have a harmonic oscillator. Uh, the only difference here is that in part A, we now want to find the probability distribution in terms of momentum P instead of X. So we're trying to find rho of P instead of rho of x. They also very conveniently give us the maximum and minimum values of p. So the range is from negative square root to me to positive square root to me. So these are sort of analogous to our uh, positive negative a values, which are the turning points in position space. And other than that, sort of the process of solving this is the exact same. So uh, we can start right away. So uh, in part 1.11 sort of the thing that we said was the or the method that we sort of described was that rho of x dx which is the probability to find our particle in some position interval dx is equal to the time interval it spends in that interval which is uh d little t uh divided by the total amount of time it takes for it to go from one so turning point to the other so from negative a to positive a which is just big t uh, analogously, in momentum space, the probability of finding our particle in some given momentum interval, dp, is equal to the time, d little t, that it spends in that interval divided by the total time it takes for our particle to transition from the minimum momentum of negative square root 2 me to the positive momentum of positive square root 2 me. So uh, the way that we actually solve this, or the way that we actually derive out the momentum uh, probability distribution is the exact same. Uh, for rho of x dx, we sort of multiplied both sides, numerator and denominator, by 1 over dx and took advantage of dt over dx to define the inverse of velocity. Here, we're going to do the same thing. So uh, here, we're, instead, we're going to multiply by 1 over dp divided by 1 over dp. And what's going to happen is that dt over dp is just the reciprocal of force, because we know that, uh, let's write this in blue, we knew that force is equal to dp over dt. And then the 1 over dp in the, de in the denominator here sort of goes up to the top because it's in the denominator anyway. So this is in fact going to e be equal to 1 over ft where F is the force on our system, and then dp. So uh, we know that for a simple harmonic oscillator, we know that the force is just equal to k negative kx. So we can write this out immediately, and we can say that the probability density rho of p is in fact equal to negative 1 over kxt where we have effectively left out the dp terms because the dps cancel out on both sides. So uh, now we have a bit of a problem because our probability density is supposed to be in terms of momentum p, but here we evidently have an expression in terms of position x. So we have to somehow find a way to relate the position to the momentum. Now, uh, the easiest way to do that is actually just to analyze the energy of the system because the energy relates position and velocity, and from there we can use it to relate momentum. So let's just do that right away. Uh, if we write out the energy equation for our harmonic oscillator, we know that the total energy is going to be equal to the sum of the kinetic energy, which is one half mv squared, added with the added with the potential energy, which for a harmonic oscillator is just going to be the spring potential, which is one half kx squared. And from here, we can instantly sort of convert our velocity term into momentum because we know that P equals MV. Therefore, uh, expressing in terms of V, then V equals P over M. So E, in fact, is equivalent to 1 half times MP squared over M squared. So one of the M's cancel, so we get P squared over M. plus one half k x squared. Let's sort of move the two over to this side. So two e minus one minus p squared 
over m squared or m is equal to k x squared so that means uh, if we move the k onto the other side then x is in fact equal to the square root of 2e minus p squared over m all divided by k let's just rewrite that to make it a little bit more legible and uh, now we can just plug that right in to our row of p expression and we have our answer so row of p is equal to negative 1 over kt and then this is the reciprocal of x so we're going to reverse everything so square root of k divided by 2e minus p squared over m and uh, i'm actually going to sort of clean this up a little bit just so that uh, everything becomes a little bit neater and we can sort of simplify everything at once. So uh, previously in 1.11, 1 1 uh, we sort of simplified out t in terms of k and m. So we're going to do the exact same thing here because otherwise this is sort of just a constant that we can't really get rid of in our expression. So we know that uh, omega is equal to the square root of k over m. So uh, as a result, uh, we can also link omega to the period. So we know that omega equals 2 pi over tau for a harmonic oscillator. And we also know that big T is the time it takes to traverse one half of the period. So T big T is in fact equal to one half of tau. And the reason why we derived in 1.11, so if you're not comfortable with this, go watch 1.11. So we can sort of link these together. So using omega, well, tau is therefore equal to 2 pi over omega. So therefore, this is equal to 2 pi square root of m over k. Uh, multiplying that by 1 half down here. So it, it is, in fact, equal to pi times the square root of m over k. Let me just make sure that that is correct. Okay, now that we have uh, an alternate version of t that is much nicer, we can plug this into our row of p expression. So we know that uh, row of p is equal to negative one over k, and then we're gonna take the reciprocal of t because t is underneath in the denominator, not the numerator. So we're gonna get one over pi times square root of k over m and then multiplied by the square root of k over 2e subtracted by p squared over m and here instantly uh, hopefully you see that the double root k cancels out with the k at the bottom here so uh, we're going to do that and write it out a little bit neater so this is equal to negative 1 over pi times the square root of 1 over and here we're just going to multiply the m into sort of the denominator here for simplicity so this is going to become 2me subtracted by p squared and this is our probability density now, to make sure that this is actually correct, one thing we can do is we can sort of do the same verification process that we did in 1.11, because we know that rho of p varies from negative root 2me to positive root 2me. So what we can say is that if this is truly the correct probability density, then we can sort of propose the requirement that the integral uh, from negative root 2me To positive root 2me of this entire expression negative 1 over pi times root 1 over 2me minus p squared we can sort of require that this must in fact equal 0 I mean not 0 must in fact equal 1 because the maximum probability is 1 so if we add all the probabilities together we should get 1 
And this is, well, actually, this is not quite right. I need the dp term at the end of this integral. So this has to equal one. And uh, if we sort of plug this into an integral calculator, which is what I'm going to do, because as I always say, this is a physics course, not a math one. Uh, and this is definitely a more mathematically intensive integral than I care to solve uh, just on paint right now. So we're just going to plug this into our uh, integral calculator. And this does, in fact, give us one. So as a result, we can say that rho of p uh, does, in fact, equal, let's just write this in a different color, rho of p does, in fact, equal this expression. And this is, in fact, the correct expression for rho of p, or at least a valid one. One final thing that I sort of want to note is that although this is technically the correct probability density, it should worry you because of the fact that we have sort of this negative down here. Uh, and evidently that doesn't really make sense. Uh, ju and just to confirm that this is in fact negative, uh, if we look at the denominator here, we have 2ma uh, e minus p squared. And we know that sort of the maximum value of p is the square root of 2me. So as a result, uh, this expression here is always going to be positive. So as a, re as a result, uh, the probability is apparently always negative. However, obviously, that doesn't really make sense uh, in most cases, uh, because obviously we can't have a negative probability. So what happens here is that uh, we can actually just straight up get rid of the negative uh, and not suffer any loss in sort of information. Um, Evidently, mathematically, that is not allowed, of course, because we can't just take away a negative. But uh, in physics, uh, because we're looking at a physical system, sort of uh, the negative doesn't actually matter. And really, uh, this expression, which does not have a negative, expresses our system just as well as a uh, system that does have a negative. Because what will happen if you did if you did have a negative is that your probability density uh, would just be underneath our x-axis and it would look something like this whereas in contrast if it was above if we didn't have the negative it would look the exact same thing it would look the exact same way just mirrored above and in both cases uh, it really doesn't actually affect the probability of our system at all if we don't include this negative it just makes it easier to read so as a result uh, we can actually just ignore the negative and pretend that it doesn't actually exist for all intents and purposes Part B is a pretty trivial exercise. It just wants us to calculate the expectation values of P, P squared, and then finally the standard deviation of P. Uh, sort of this is just a plug and chug maneuver where we take our equation, the probability density in terms of P, and then just attach P and P squared and then integrate all of all over the valid interval of negative root 2me to positive 2 root me, as we've always done for these kinds of problems. So I'm I've taken the liberty of sort of rewriting everything here. Uh, once again, uh, we're writing rho of p without the negative sign in front. Uh, even though it's not mathematically correct, it doesn't actually lose anything in our system and it makes everything more simple uh, anyway. So because of that, we're just going to do that. And the expectation value of p uh, is just going to be this thing uh, integrated over the valid interval of p from negative root 2me to positive root 2me. Uh, and then after that, we just attach the p at the front and this gives us zero. Uh, using the same thing for p squared will give us me. So as a result, the standard deviation of p is just going to equal the square root of me. In part c, uh, we are first off asked to multiply the standard deviation of x and p, sort of to visualize uh, the uncertainty principle for this system. So we're going to do that uh, in part in 1.11, we sort of already found the standard deviation x to be a over root 2. Uh, and then just now in part b, we solved for the standard deviation in p to be square root of m over e. Multiplying them together gives us this expression. Uh, and then from here, uh, we can sort of express a in terms of e as well, because we know that the energy, the maximum energy of our system, uh, let's write this in orange, we know that the maximum energy of our system is actually equal to just 1 half ka squared. where A is sort of our turning point. So at 1 half Ka squared, sort of the energy of the system is entirely spring potential with the particle not moving at all. So uh, plugging this in, then we get that the standard deviation of X times the standard deviation in P is equal to E times the square root of M over K. And this sort of seems to violate the uncertainty principle because it seems like we could just decrease the energy of our system to zero and that would evidently violate sort of the requirement that the standard deviation 
of x times the standard deviation deviation of p has to be greater or equal to h bar over 2. This is the uncertainty principle, uh, and we covered this uh, a few sections back. And it seems like we can just violate this. However, uh, it's not necessarily true, and I don't really like the way that Griffiths sort of does this, but he sort of tells us uh, in quantum mechanics, the simple harmonic oscillator actually has a minimum energy value. Uh, and we can't prove this, we have no way of proving this right now, and we will cover it later in chapter 2, but for now, uh, we are sort of forced by Griffiths to accept this fact. So we are forced to accept the fact that E must be greater than or equal to h bar over 2 times omega, which is equal to square root of k over m. So if we plug this back in to our standard deviation uh, product, we get that the product of sigma x and sigma p has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2, and then square root of k over m times square root of m over k just gives us 1. So this, in fact, does obey the uh, uncertainty principle. However, this is, in my opinion, a very unsatisfying resolution, because, once again, we are sort of forced to accept the fact that the energy of a harmonic oscillator can't be less than h bar omega over 2, and we don't really have a way of proving it. And unfortunately, uh, that is sort of where we're going to have to end it, because uh, we don't actually have a way of proving this until we actually analyze uh, a simple harmonic oscillator under the lens of quantum physics later on in chapter 2.